الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد my dear respected brothers sisters and elders after the first world war and then especially after 9/11 muslims we've had a problem with pr we've had a problem with our image and we will we were you know we were labeled as people who caused tr- problems we were labeled as terrorists and the image that was depicted was that muslims were such that historically we had the quran in one hand and the sword in the other thus inferring that the way islam spread was that you either accepted islam or you die however that was not the case uh, there's a professor at georgetown university drodrick davison he taught he taught from 1947 to 1993 almost 50 years 46 years he taught he wrote a book it's called Re- reform of the ottoman empire and in that when he talks about how the ottoman empire how the muslim empire how they dealt with their people he says that the way the islamic empire the way the ottoman empire dealt with minority groups it was much better than the way the prussians dealt with the poles it was much better than the way the turk the english dealt with the irish and it was much better than the way the americans uh, had dealt with the african americans and he he goes on to say he says there's evidence that there were people from in the ottoman empire at the time of the ottoman empire that had migrated from greece to the ottoman empire they found that their own greek government was not as welcoming as the ottoman empire so historically the reason people liked islam the reason people accepted islam was because they inherently liked the system was because they inherently liked their religion and so this public perception how do we change it it's very difficult to change it through education it's very difficult that we educate everyone on what islam is supposed to be on what islam teaches it's very difficult to do that mainly because we ourselves don't have that level of education and it's unfeasible to do that however what we can do is we change people's perceptions about islam through interaction when we interact with non-muslims when they see how we interact with them they will be attracted towards islam and when we and we present ourselves in such a way we make ourselves presentable that people will be attracted to this religion however when we're doing that <clears throat> we can't uh there's only so much leniency we have uh when we're trying to make ourselves presentable we have to maintain the tenets of our religion there are some things that we simply cannot compromise on <clears throat> allah says very clearly in the quran he tells prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says tell the people the that qul ya ayyuhal kafirun la a'budu ma ta'budun allah is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling the non muslims what you worship i will not worship and what i worship you do not worship and the last ayah the last sentence he says lakum dinukum wa liya din for you is your religion and for me is mine <clears throat> i cannot compromise my beliefs i cannot compromise what i believe in but you make yourself presentable islam is not a rigid religion Islam is such that a person who does not practice Islam he will be attracted to it by the people who practice Islam and it's it's one of my teachers used to say it's important it's necessary for us that when non-muslims look at us they have the love of Islam in their heart it's necessary for us to gain that love why only then will they hear the true Islam only then will they want to accept Islam and if someone just by looking at you does not like you by your actions because of the way you are because of the way you act how is that person ever going to want to accept islam and so you you present yourself in such a way that they have love for muslims and then that love for muslims will tra- will translate into a love of islam and when dealing with these people you have to understand when dealing with people who are not of your religion you have to understand that they they see things from a different perspective than we do we are muslims alhamdulillah allah made us muslims so we we see things on a more intimate level we see the ins and outs of islam the other people are not like that if if they perceive some of them perceive that a th- uh, this is a threat 
After the 9-11 attacks, my father and I, we were in uh, a grocery store and I was wearing, you know, similar clothing. And someone said something racist to us. Someone said something, you know, derogatory to us. And I was very young at the time. And I, you know, I was very hot-blooded. I, I used to get angry very fast. And uh, I started charging towards that person. I didn't know what I was going to do when I caught up to him, but I started charging towards that person. I got mad. So my father held me back. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I said, what, you didn't hear what he just said? You didn't hear how he just insulted us? How he just insulted our religion? And he says, uh, he doesn't know. That's why he's saying that. He doesn't know. It's, this is his perception. You need to change his perception, not go and hit him. And this is, this is, this is the, the personality or the, the character that Prophet Muhammad has taught us. Um, the hadith when Prophet Muhammad he was wiping blood off of his face because the non-Muslims had attacked him. What did he say? Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my people. They just don't know. If they had known, they wouldn't have done something like this. They just don't know. And so we, we treat these people, the people who, who think ill of us, they simply don't know. And it's our job to make ourselves presentable to them. It's our job that they, when they look at us, they want to accept Islam. And uh, the hadith of Abu Dawood, Prophet Muhammad said, Anzilu nasa manazilahum. Deal with people according to their status. And so if a person is not a Muslim, he doesn't know who Prophet Muhammad is. He doesn't know who the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are. He doesn't know any of these things. And you say, you should accept Islam. He says, why should I accept Islam? He says, oh, Prophet Muhammad said, Hadith of Bukhari, Hadith of Ibn Majah, Hadith of Darmi. He said, you should do this. It doesn't make sense. So you have to deal with people according to their status. You have to deal with them at a level that they will understand. Keeping in mind that you cannot force your religion on others. We are a minority in this country. Even if we were a majority in this country, we have no right to force religion on others. At the time of Umar, when he was the Khalifa, when he was the, the leader of the Muslims, it's fair to say that the Muslims were in the majority. And Umar, he had an advisor. He was a Jewish person. And Umar told him that, you know, if you convert to Islam, it will be very easy for me. For me. It will be very beneficial for me. I can discuss with you these sensitive matter, matters that pertain to Muslims and I'm not comfortable uh, you know, discussing with non-Muslims. And he says, no, I don't want to change my religion. I, whatever my religion is, I want to keep it. And Umar said, okay, that's fine. La ikraha fid deen. There is no forcing in religion. Allah says in the Quran, la ikraha fid deen. You cannot, there is no forcing in religion. You cannot force your religion on others. And when we're, when, we're, when we're dealing with people who have different beliefs than we are, we have to have tolerance. Uh, look at the way the Prophet ﷺ, he handled injustice against him. When someone told him, Qila ya Rasulullah ﷺ, Make dua, the word ala is used. Ala means make dua against the Muslims, against the non-Muslims, on the al-mushrikeen, on the polytheists, those who do shirk. Make dua against those people who do shirk. And... He, you know, if, if the Prophet ﷺ, his dua is so accepted, just imagine how much his curse would be accepted. If the Prophet ﷺ curse a group of people, just imagine how much it would be accepted. And so what was his reply? He says, um, I wasn't sent here to send a curse on people. I was sent here as a form of mercy. And so he did not want to be the one to curse people. He wanted to be the one who spread mercy. And so, uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when it comes to having interactions, when it comes to having relations with people who are, 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 are not of your faith, He says, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصدوا إليهم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, it is not prohibited for you that you become friend, or it is not prohibited for you that those people who don't try to exile you from your land, and those people who don't try to fight you, those people who don't try to fight you, and those people who don't try to exile you from your land, it is not prohibited that you do good with them, and you do justice with them, you do just by them. And um, Imam Tabari, Ibn Jarir Tabari, he's a, he's a scholar of exegesis, he's a scholar of tafsir, he says uh, in his tafsir, لم يقاتلوكم في الدين من جميع أصناف الملل والأديان أن تبروهم وتسلوهم وتقصدوا إليهم. He says from every type of ملل, every nation, والديان, and from every type of religion, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah azza wa ta'ala, amma falam yukhassis ba'dan duna ba'dan. He, Allah made it general. It doesn't matter who it is. He made it general. He did not specify. You can only be friends with this group of people. You can only have good relations with these group of people. Allah, he made it general. And Imam Abu Mansur Maturidi, rahmatullah alayhi, he is uh, the scholar of Aqidah. Uh, he has a tafsir as well, that we love the Sunnah. He, uh, under this ayah, he says, this ayah is explained by another ayah. What is that ayah? وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمًا عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, it should not, f- when, a, when, a, when, a, when a group of people does bad to you, that should not force you to do bad to them. That should not force you to be unjust. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, اِعْدِلُوا You have to be just. And so we have to be tolerant we have to understand the perspective of others and once we're open-minded once we understand the perspective of others then we can make ourselves presentable we can make ourselves such that when people look at us they like islam they are attracted to islam and so we make dua to allah that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us the ability the tawfiq the, uh, the capability to act upon this and make ourselves muslims not only by name but muslims by game <laughs> الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباد الذين اصطفى ما بعد my dear respected brothers sisters and elders <coughs> our tolerance should not be limited to just non-muslims we must be tolerant of other muslims as well and within muslims there are two types of disagreements there are two things intrinsically fundamentally that muslims disagree upon the first is aqida though our aqaid our beliefs what do we believe in uh, Allah's attributes, what do we say about Allah's attributes? Was the Prophet ﷺ, was, did he have limited knowledge or unlimited knowledge? And so we have, th- th- these are the things that, in terms of belief, one group of Muslims has one belief, another group of Muslims has another, group, has another belief. That's fiqh akbar, the great fiqh, the great uh, uh, jurisprudence. And then the other is al-fiqh al-asqar, the small fiqh, the small jurisprudence. Uh, things like, do I have to raise my hand if, uh, when I go into ruku? Do it, does, if blood exits my body, does that invalidate my wudu or not? This is fiqh asghar. So these are the two things that Muslims have a disagreement, up, disagreement upon. And in al-fiqh al-asghar, the disagreements that stem amongst the scholars, they can trace back to disagreements amongst the sahaba. The Sahaba themselves, one Sahaba did something one way, and another Sahaba did something another way. But they respected each other. They respected each other's opinions, they respected each other's way of life. I'll give you one example, Hadith of Bukhari. Muawiyah radiallahu an, he used to pray with her after Isha prayer, he used to pray one rak'ah. Awtara Muawiyah radiallahu Isha bi rak'atin. He used to do with her with one rak'ah. Wa'indahu Mawla li ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, his freed slave, uh, he was, he was sitting next to, or he was watching Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Fa'ata ibn Abbasin, and ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he, he uh, imam, ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, his slave, his freed slave, went to ibn Abbas, and he said, look, look this is how Muawiyah is praying, uh, he, this is how he prays. What did ibn Abbas say? Faqala, da'hu, leave him, leave him be, don't mess with him. Fa'innahu sahiba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is a sahabi, he is a companion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was Ibn Abbas not a companion? Was Ibn Abbas not knowledgeable? Ibn Abbas is considered one of the greatest companions. Ibn Abbas is considered one of the most knowledgeable of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what, he, what did he say? Da'hu. He understood that you have to respect each, each other's opinions. And this, you know, if one person believes one thing and someone else disagrees with you, that does not mean that, that person is trying to disrespect you. And a lot of times there was more than one way to do something. That's why you have this difference of opinion. For example, Hadith of Bukhari, Umar, Umar Allah, he said that one time I was uh, sitting in the masjid and I heard Hisham bin Hakim bin Hizam, Allah, and he was reading Surah Furqan in prayer. And he was reading it differently than the way I learned it. And uh, Umar, Allah, he said, I got so angry that I wanted to go and talk to him, but he was praying, so I let him finish his prayer. And then I took him to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and I said, look, look how he's reading the Qur'an. And Prophet said, okay, iqra. 
read it, um, read the Quran. Uh, he told Hisham bin Hakim bin Hizam, he said, read the Quran. And so he read Surah Al-Quran and Prophet ﷺ said, Hakada unzirat. This is how it was revealed. Then he told Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, you read the Quran. And he read the Surah Al-Quran as well, but he read it differently than how Hisham bin Hakim bin Hizam radiallahu how he read it. He read it differently. And he said, Hakada unzilat. This is also how it was revealed. So there are multiple times, there are multiple ways to do something in that. And so even the Sahaba, they don't agree completely upon one thing. And this is, you know, this is a lecture in its own, why there's ikhtilaf amongst the Sahaba, why there's ikhtilaf amongst the scholars, why they have disagreements upon such things. It's all because of they interpret a hadith and ayahs of the Quran differently. And no one way is right, no one way is wrong. But there, you just have to be consistent with how you do it. And so, you know, these are things that even the Sahaba couldn't agree upon. So how are we as the followers of the Prophet Muhammad 1300, 1400 years later going to solve all these problems? We can't. We simply can't. And so the best solution is, is we become, you know, just, we don't, we don't try to, uh, you know, elevate the problem. You accept everyone's opinion and you respect everyone's opinion. It doesn't matter if someone is, you know, he, he raises his hands when he goes into ruku. It doesn't matter if a person reads Amin out loud, if a person reads, if a person, you know, reads Amin uh, in a low voice. These things, these are very small things. There's one thing that we know for sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not ask you, why did that person read Amin out loud? Or he will not ask you, why did that person do such and such? He will only ask you about your own sins. He will only ask you about your own good deeds. He will only ask you about what you chose to do. He will not ask you about anyone else. What does Allah say? وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No one will have to uh, take on the burden of anyone else. And just in, an example of this respect of other people's opinion, Imam Shafi, he was, one of the, he, was, he was a great scholar of Islam. And uh, he was of the opinion that before going to Ruku, you should, you should raise your hands. And uh, he went to the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa in Kufa. And when he went there, he, you know, the, the people recognized that such a great scholar is here, so they asked him to lead the prayer. And he led the prayer, and when he went to Ruku, he did not raise his hands. He was of the opinion that you should raise your hands when you go into Ruku, but he didn't raise his hands. So after the prayer was done, People asked him, Ya Shaykh, did you, did you change your fatwa? You know, you used to say that you have to raise your hands before going to ruku. Did you change your fatwa? He says, no, I didn't change my fatwa. It was out of respect for this man laying here. This man laying here, Abu Hanifa, he, used, he did not, uh, he never used to, um, uh, he, he never used to raise his hands before going to ruku. And so out of respect for his opinion, I decided not to do that when I'm praying next to his grave, when I'm praying in his city. And so this is the respect they had. He had difference of opinion. He had, he had a huge you know, disagreement with him, but he respected him. Or one of my teachers used to say, who has more ikhtilaf, who has more disagreements than the, uh, the, the, than the imams of fiqh? Who has more disagreements than them? And then he also used to say, who has more ihtiram than the imams of fiqh? Who has more respect for one another than the imams of fiqh? And uh, and, and the, the, you know, the history is full of stories and events where they respected each other, where they, where they had tolerance for one another. Imam Malik, alayhi, he was teaching hadith and um, he, an old person came and he, said, and the, and he, stopped his, he stopped his lesson and he got up and, started, he, and he went to talk to that person, to that old man. And uh, his students got very upset. He said, you know, why, some guy came, big deal, and you interrupted our lesson for him. And so Imam Malik, he replied, this person, if he wants to, if he starts giving you proof, he starts giving you evidence that this pillar here, this is made of, this is made of gold, he will give you so many proofs, he will give you so much evidence that you'll start believing him. He had respect, and this person was Imam Abu Hanifa. He had respect for that person. And they had respect for each other. They had huge amounts of disagreements, but they had respect. And so, inshallah, we make dua to Allah that Allah gives us the ability to combine both, um, you know, disagreements and respect. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا واسرافنا في يمنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين